Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, the subtitle is new. I hope it's okay. Um, because I uh, all of a sudden realized that that's what, what I was doing, doing a dif diffractive reading. So diffractive reading, I have an um, interest in uh, new materialism and in post-humanism. And there the idea of, of diffraction is, is, is important, as Vera knows. Uh, so it's very much about uh, trying to read two authors uh, and combining them in, in such a way that actually something different might uh, come into existence. It seemed like a nice idea also for this uh, get together because we are exploring, I think, um, how to um, institutionalize perhaps um, Serre. Um, I've been a part of a uh, part, or at least uh, I've been doing some work on Deleuze for, for a while. And uh, the work of Gilles Deleuze has been uh, for 20 years already uh, institutionalized through conferences and book series and whatever. And, uh, and there's a, a tons of Deleuze dictionaries, as we may know. Uh, and it's interesting to see how for Ser, for weird reasons, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, that has not happened yet. Uh, uh, and it would be interesting to see how this goes because so many different contributions also to this uh, get together, which is, which is beautiful, of course. And I'm not interested in, uh, in turning this into some kind of a canon or whatever. Uh, it's actually nice to see the diversity. So uh, yeah, what will happen next? Um, so a uh, diffractive reading of Marx and Serre, which uh, also allows me to start on uh, doing some work on Marx um, uh, and then see how I can combine this with Serre, which is not very uh, of, uh, uh, yeah, for, for, for Serre scholars, I guess uh, Marx has played a very difficult role in his uh, career, so I, I know that, and uh, but still we can do it. Um, oh, yeah. That's me. Um, this can go somewhere as always. Yeah. So I want to talk mainly about uh, the five senses, which is also nice because we talk about such different parts of his career, and this is also a book which for me at least is very valuable. Um, so it's good to pay some attention to that. Five senses and especially the chapter on tables, I find intriguing. Um, so this is a quote from it. Uh, Our sense of smell slides from knowledge to memory and from space to time, no doubt from things to beings. So that's kind of the motto from which I start my reading of Marx and then especially the Grundrisse, not too surprising, but that's of course the texts that we can learn the most from. It's uh, only been around uh, since 1939, I think. Uh, so uh, after Marxism, <laughs> uh, and that's just, especially for contemporary scholarship, I think it's an enormously rich text, which, which talks an awful lot about nature uh, I'm very much interested in, in ecology and in the crises that uh, are uh, um, uh, connected to that, which is also what, what brought me to Serre long ago. Um, and in the Grundrisse, I mean, there are pages where he mentions the term nature 20 times on one page, which is not the marks that has been canonized, uh, at least up until like 10 years ago when then then articles appeared in some books, especially in French, uh, on uh, on the green Marx or Marx in ecology. Uh, but still, in terms of scholarship, uh, I think uh, there's there's still much to uh, explore. Um, as we know, the Grundriss is more like a kind of a notebook where he kind of thinks freely. But uh, I do think that he's very precise in his conceptualization of things. Uh, and especially when it comes to his uh, key concepts like the common uh, or uh, like uh, alienation. Um, and, 
as said, uh, I think that we can do something with that also as sales scholars. So as a starting point, uh, it was also interesting earlier, but I, I think mentioned the whole idea of democracy. Uh, that's also quite interesting. The, the word demos uh, is often translated as the people, have power to the people. But uh, actually the word demos refers to, uh, it comes closer to the idea of the common. It, it more refers to those who inhabit the land. So Koreani writes a lot about that, the Japanese Marxist. Uh, those who inhabit the land doesn't even have to be humans actually, by the way. So those, uh, the power to those who, who inhabit the land which I think is a very interesting uh, and very different idea than power to the people. Anyway, uh, the, term of, the term the common, of course, is hugely important for Marx. And uh, in um, Grundrisse, he um, is very precise in saying that what he considers uh, the common is not the agar publicus. So it's not the common ground, which is at the center of the village or at the edge of the village, which everyone can make use of from where you... Uh, get your wood and uh, where you uh, drop your sheep, whatever. That's not what he's talking about. The common for Marx is something which he relates actually to, uh, he calls it the German tribes. Uh, mainly uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, that's the, the time at least that he has in mind. Um, and he finds this a very interesting uh, kind of a society because there's a lot of common. Uh, tribes live scattered around Germany, but they come together. And this, uh, so they're not being, that's he also is very precise on that. They're not, it's not about being together. The common is about coming together. Vereinigung, not a verein. And that is for him uh, very important also when it comes to seeing uh, the common as uh, a unmistakable part of the self. So the common is not so much organized or institutionalized in society as the common ground or whatever, but is is a very kind of the way you are attached to the land, the terroir, as the French would say it. I don't think there's a very good English translation for terroir. No. Um, Sorry? Seat. The seat, yeah. Is that also, does it also have to do with food and tasting and sensing? No. <laughs> the terroir in the well, local... It's definitely about, it's definitely about feeling that, that you... That you, you mean, belong, yeah. a sense of belonging. Well, yeah, no, but uh, especially terroir in French is nice because it's, I mean, whenever the French open a bottle of wine, terroir occurs. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, I think, very important also for uh, Sam, especially, of course, in uh, in five senses. Uh, so, but um, uh, what is what what is interesting is that this idea of the common is is for him um, uh, something which. Uh, it's almost Freudian, comes the, the unspeakable part of yourself. Uh, and he calls it also, as I put it in the subtitle here, inorganic nature. He talks of organic nature of man uh, and the inorganic nature, which is, uh, uh, as I said, an inextricable part of it. The common for him, therefore, also presupposes labor. It is not the product of labor. This is what he finds problematic in the, the whole idea of the agro publicus which is already very much entangled with an idea of labor. Um, but somehow the common for Marx is, uh, is, yeah, as said, he used the term nature a lot and the earth. Um, so there's organic nature of man and inorganic nature with man. In the middle of this quote, it says that on the side of the living individual. So, so the common is not the uh, presupposed labor, uh, not its product, but already there as nature. On the one side, he sees there is the living individual. And on the other side, there's the earth as the objective condition of his reproduction. So as one artist once told me, everything we have, either we took it from the earth or we grew it on the earth. 
which is uh, uh, very much kind of uh, the, the condition of his reproduction, inextricable part of the self. Um, and he also makes a nice uh, summary there. Right? These presuppositions of activities are his land, his skin, and his sense organs. So this is where kind of the self, very much before talking, before language, before communication, as Marx would uh, write about it, uh, comes into being. Uh, So the pre-bourgeois relation uh, of the individual uh, to the objective conditions of labor uh, uh, and initially, initially to the natural objective conditions of labor. That's what he focuses on. The first objective condition of, his, uh, of this appears as nature, earth, the inorganic body. He himself is not only the inorganic body, but also the subject of, his inorgan of this inorganic body. And there comes the quote, uh, but this relationship to land and soil to the earth as the property of the laboring individual is instantly mediated by the natural horizon, spontaneous, more or less historically developed and modified presence of the individual as member of the commune. So it is before language, before property, that this inorganic nature is always already part of the organic nature of human. And the idea of the commune is, is actually quite important there because uh, this process of individualization is uh, for him uh, more something which comes in the end with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with labor, uh, of course, with capitalism. And, and actually then this whole idea of alienation comes about, which is also quite interesting. So when he talks about alienation in the Grundrisse, it is very much about how uh, the commune, the whole idea of the commune as it appeared in German tribes, um, has slowly but gradually been lost by the coming of bourgeois society. Now, I find this very interesting because as we read the uh, Serre, especially in uh, the, the five senses, he makes uh, also an, 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 uh, he, he talks about the, the first and the second tongue. Um, we are familiar with the first tongue, which is kind of communication and language and also destruction in many ways is very much linked to it. We are very much not familiar anymore with the fact that in the end, uh, this second tongue of tasting and smelling uh, is in the end, actually, it's, it's, it's actually much more fundamental to uh, our being, our becoming, and perhaps also our sense of communality uh, than, than what can be labeled the first tongue. And the whole idea of Homo sapiens, he mentions that several times actually, uh, is of course also interesting because it doesn't refer to wisdom, or at least uh, later it referred to wisdom, but his wisdom was very much connected to saper, to have a taste. So for Ser too, uh, actually this, what Marx calls his inorganic nature is uh, fundamental uh, in many ways for uh, how we connect and how we are able to uh, kind of uh, come together. That's why the title is uh, of course brilliant, at the table, what happens at the table. So the table is of course about eating and drinking and smelling and tasting. Uh, and it is, of course, also a coming together. So without Sarah talking a lot about uh, the common, uh, I think that uh, this uh, combined with Marx, there's a very interesting uh, kind of uh, rethinking of what communality should actually be about. 
Sarah writes a lot about uh, in this in this chapter about how we lost our ability to taste and smell and how we don't seem to understand the importance of it for us uh, for our coming together uh, a few quotes on the we used to read in our textbook that our intellect knows nothing uh, that has not first passed through the senses. What we hear through our tongue is that there is uh, nothing in sapience that has not first passed through mouth and taste, through sapidity. And then this is a, this is what I find brilliant of Michel said. This is such a very kind of uh, obvious kind of everyday quote, but there's so much in it. 1930, the year I was born, produced an unspeakable liquid and nothing better. Yet 1929, when my brother was born, uh, has been equally uh, equaled only three times since in the whole Bordeaux region in 45, 61 and 75. Once in a lifetime vintages of supernatural taste and enormous longevity. As though weather and time, of course, he talks about tons again, were intimately connected. I find this amazing because this is uh, one of those, uh, I mean, this is where you see terroir at work. And this is where you see what Marx was also hinting at. The fact that this commune, that this... Uh, communality of living together and uh, the living together is then not human but very much eh? uh, living together according to the land uh, that we live humans and non-humans with all the fungi that are also involved here uh, organic and inorganic that that is really what the common is about and of course it's really spot on how this comes together in a bottle of wine. Um, we talked earlier also about uh, technology and about uh, how, not so much about capitalism, but how, um, how alienation in that sense uh, could work. Uh, by a sense, uh, as said already, uh, the theory of knowledge, uh, untying knots and refusing to tie them again, tolerates only one side of the equation, the analytical. So in the end, the theory of knowledge focuses on the combination, uh, the, the communication that is available through the tongue that speaks and not so much through the tongue that tastes. And that has led to a situation, as uh, has uh, uh, taught for many years in uh, in uh, Stanford, down the wind of a fast food chain is what he says, actually. <laughs> so we know what happens. <laughs> um, America leads the way, he says, and the body, as we know, it, is becoming more and more undifferentiated. Undifferentiated, of course, also more or less refers to the hurricane and kind of, uh, how, uh, how we lost the sense of diversity in that, in that idea. And like food, it is tending towards de-differentiation, infantile, mammalian. Uh, it is returning to its sweet, milky oranges. I announced already that this also comes with a critique of technology. Not so much that Sarah critiques technology, but the kind of technology that, that we've been obsessed by. Uh, for instance, robotics. Uh, this is a beautiful quote again. A robot with a tongue of stone, iron or wood, it speaks. It can, cannot know thirst. We know how to build machines that talk. We do not know how to build robots that can drink or taste. A tongue can become artificial. Intelligence frequency does, but sapience never does. It is in this sense that an automaton differs from homo sapiens. Again, the word sapiens comes from tasting and smelling. Uh, it has a first tongue, not a second. So he plays also with the term, uh, the aestheticization of land and the anesthetic. Uh, so the, the, the kind of deafness and blindness that is perhaps also 
inextricably connected to, to capitalism and to the way alienation works. Uh, so in that sense, the common, I would say, is very much linked to the aestheticization of land, very much about living the good life uh, according to the land and living, creating the good life according to the land. And that is something that we lost or we don't understand anymore how this aestheticization of, of the land works. And then um, the chapter more or less ends with a warning. In the future, war will not break out between cultures with hard differences, but will pit against each other those on the one hand whose nutritional or cultural ethnology can still be described, and the other uh, those who will vegetate in the absence of sapience and sagacity. Anesthetized, drugs, fridged, frigged. So that is uh, that is very very much linked to how Marx would uh, talk about also about alienation and about the way in which we have lost uh, the idea of the commune and uh, the whole idea of. Uh, Communality as connected to the land and to uh, what the land produces and terroir and those things. I think that's more or less what my time was all about, right? Yeah. Thank you, Rick. I was really excited for this talk because this is one of my research areas that has been for some time, philosophy mm -hmm. based in culinary art. Uh, and I appreciated the connection that you drew between anesthesia and ser and alienation in Marx because I hadn't made that connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really useful for thinking about uh, the relationship between the fast food restaurant or the, the bottle of Coca Cola and the unique bottle of Chateau de Chem that he talks about at length in that chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for that. Um, is there a kind of comparable epistemological, because I have not read Marx very deeply, is there a kind of uh, comparable epistemological uh, parallel going on in Marx? So with Sayer, taste is not the chief sensory modality, it's one of many, and it has that sort of federative uh, relationship to the other senses. Uh, so. It isn't that sight and the other senses don't matter, but taste regains some importance as a philosophical sense, right? It can, we can taste space and time, right? The point that you were making. Yeah. Is there something like that with Marx um, that might deepen the parallel? And I, this is purely a curiosity question on my part. But the answer is no, that's not. I think the, the quick answer is no. I mean, it talks about fire, Abend, of course, and that's also something that should get more attention the way in which uh, the class uh, the class differences are are related to 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 sensing in that sense um, but um, in the Grundris, uh, he's mainly interested in land and nature and oh sorry yeah uh, land and nature and in uh, and very explicit about or for instance, uh, yeah, an, an idea of property that it precedes property, uh, which for terroir is also very difficult to uh, to say, right? Terroir is also moving around and is so kind of sensitive to the winds and whatever. So it's much more about understanding terroir than if there's no idea of. And Marx makes a difference between uh, possessing and uh, possession and uh, uh, and ownership. But, so so yeah. going back to the fraction, and I'm not familiar with that term, Sarah might play an epistemological bridge or nosological bridge in that account of Marx. Um, we're reading those two together. Is that sort of the drift of... Yeah, the so the, the, the diffraction uh, is a term which uh, comes from the exact sciences, uh, more like a more pattern uh, where two kind of movements come together and create a new type of movement, which is not so much reducible to the two previous movements. Sure. 
So in the end, I think what I'm saying here about the common is not so much reducible either to Marx or to Serre, but it's really about how to read them together and what and that can be very fruitful, of course. It's well, what people like uh, Serre and Deleuze themselves have also done uh, many times. So, so and, and I'm just interested in how they can be combined and what, uh, what this also tells us about uh, human being, especially in our times and how, we're, how we relate to the land uh, and how we can rethink capitalism according to our senses. So, so those things are interesting to me. Bernadette, please. Oh, Just a minute. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for thank you for your your presentation. I think that we could connect what you said about uh, the terroir, about sensing the common, to what say Serge says about pollution as appropriation, because a polluted terroir is completely anesthetized. There is no more life in it. There is no bacteria, nothing. And uh, sensing the terroir is also, could also be uh, connected to the idea that the, the soil yeah. itself is living, you know? And it's a, it's a place for many, many organisms to who coexist and are inter interdependent between them, bacteria, fungi, uh, insects, everything. So it, I, it makes sense to connect that with the, the notion of uh, uh, agriculture as being taking care of the soil as much as of, uh, of the plants. Exactly, yeah. So that would fit Marx also very well, of course. Uh, Caring for the soil. Cool. I, no, well, does Bernadette want to? Oh, sorry, Bernadette, do you want to come back on that? No, 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 thank you. No, no, thank you. Um, yes, I, I was intrigued by this as well, um, this sense of anesthetization. Um, I wonder if we uh, could, taking up a, a, a sort of term that's, that's common perhaps in, in sociological or e even news circles nowadays which is food poverty um whereby it's not merely that um those who live in cities have long been disinvested with the, the, any sense of terror and perhaps have depleted any sense of taste or recognition or even the ability to recognize what a real potato should taste like um but th there is more Profoundly than that, there's, there, there are islands of food poverty. They talk about this in, in the United States. And um, it's true over here as well. Um, whereby uh, it's, not, it, it, it's not even anymore that you could get those things and train yourself and de-anesthetize yourself perhaps. Um, if you wanted to, but the shop that you can reach because you haven't got a car, doesn't have anything but, uh, you know, alphabetic spaghetti. Um, but you can't, but you actually can, to some extent, recreate the experience if you go to the right restaurant who, who's, you know, whose chef promises to source the ingredients from the right place and won't have it touched by, you know, the wrong processes and, and, and so on and so on. Hmm. So really, the only way you can get that, perhaps... Uh, it's an overstatement, but in, in that sort of developing channel, like channels of things, the only way you can get back to the terroir is by being precisely the person who can't occupy the land, who, who never occupies the land, who doesn't go there, but it's mediated by somebody who remembers this and knows what it could and should be. Yeah, then you go to restaurants like No Mine uh, yeah. in, uh, in Copenhagen, where you spend a fortune for foraging on, uh, yeah on some uh, local carrots uh, yeah i think i think here we need marx again because uh, marx is um, helping us also in understanding that it, yes i mean the, the the food part and the sensing part in that sense is hugely important but the kind of uh, the, the whole idea that there's an inorganic part of you that is not 
uh, I don't think many people experience that when they go for dinner with Noma. To to be honest, mm -hmm. I think that uh, yeah. what Marx uh, tries to show us is that alienation. I mean, it's also not uh, something that can be solved easily. Of course, <laughs> we're not here for that. But it's uh, it's interesting to see how uh, in Marx he pays so much attention to these. It, it, I put this between records all the time, Germanic tribes, because it sounds a bit uh, odd, especially these days. But uh, Germanic tribes as a kind of uh, uh, a, a different form of society uh, in which the kind of communality uh, precedes uh, the bourgeois and the way in which uh, the institutions that have I mean, it had already been developed in the Roman era, uh, create some something like a, 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 the common ground. But that's that's not what Marx is about. Um, it's really about about having a feeling also for the terroir. What Serre also writes about that he wants his um, fresh vegetables in, wrapped in a day, wrapped in the in the newspaper of today, something like that, somewhere. Like, like really fresh. I mean, that is a kind of sensing of the terroir and a kind of understanding the importance of it. And uh, I guess uh, that is inextricably connected to the idea of the common, as I'm interested in, at least. Um, yeah, I think this is related to that. Um, so I think first, you know, I, I quite like, I can see the relationship between wine and the common, um, like we come together around the table, there's something shared, there's our shared needs to eat and drink, there's something ritualistic about it. But the focus on like mega vintages from Baldo instead of, um, you know, Van de Table, which would maybe fit with the A Table um, subheading a bit more, that seems to, you know, put us into this realm of taste and refinement and, uh, luxury that is inaccessible to the common man. So I wonder about if in moving and redefining the demos around the terroir, you lose the connection with the proletarian. Um, and maybe it's too big a question, but also, you know, it's, it's kind of Marx's interest in Germanic tribes and um, trying to remember the other comment. Oh, well, uh, the kind of the idea that the war will be fought between people who have uh, culture and food and those who have kind of lost all connection made me think of Putin saying we need to we're justified in our war in Ukraine because they just don't have culture this I mean there, there's no Ukrainian identity um and so I wonder about the kind of fascist root and Boden side of the return to the earth also um so maybe too quick but is the, is that is there something like reactionary in this attempt to return to the terroir and something kind of um safaria's taste and refinement Uh, there's a fascist in all of us, of course, uh, but uh, I think it's not so much a question of return. Uh, so I'm not offering a solution, and I don't think that uh, Serre offers one, and uh, not even Marx, especially not in the Gondry. So he's just kind of trying to analyze what's going on. Uh, of course, the the the, the narrative has been uh, used. But still, it's not the kind of uh, things that Mark talks about when he says that he talks about the inorganic person. It's, it's not about property. So the blue and Boden is very much about property. We own it, move away, it's ours. And that's, it's not about property with Marx. It very much precedes it. A very good question. Marx, you want to come back? No. It might relate perhaps a bit to that, but for, from another end, I find it extremely powerful and interesting if there is a, a possibility to link the common to luxury, especially if luxury then is no longer to, um, conceived of in terms of a, a good that one can own. But what it still establishes, of course, is a kind of a sense of identity, I guess, if you can share the sapiens. You can share the taste. Mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot of um, um, distinctions. The sociologist, what's his name again? Mm -hmm. So there, there is even even if there 
even if there is not so much a, a focus point on, on, on ownership, but with the, the property, there still is a kind of a classification dynamics in relation to it. That's one side. And the other side is because you have this uh, quote from Sarah, which dates quite a bit back, where he was very sure that sapiens cannot be artificially um, produced different from, from speaking or from reading. I'm not sure if this is adequate to say today, because the, um, the, the, the precious, the expensive, the fine food dishes are highly engineered on the level of precisely how we have learned to, to, um, to, to reproduce certain tastes. Now, the question is, I think, the same, like with, with language and understanding. So computers can be, uh, so intelligence can become artificial relative to how we quantify what understanding means. No? And, and the same, I would say, goes with taste. So relative to how we can quantify what, the, what taste is, of course, it can today also be artificial. So, but when we would, that's what I would like to, to ask what, what you are thinking about that. When we would say this, um, the, the, the dispute, whether it makes a huge difference, whether it's actually the soil, which one doesn't own, where one just wanders through, that has produced a certain sapiens, or whether the sapiens itself can become kind of nomadic, no? so deterritorialized in its production, and still be a value. Because then the sapiens would go together with a kind of a education in literacies and so on, that would then have to be linked with a cultivation of a common that would not aim at identifying property in for either sense, no ontologically through classification or through the goods that one owns. Would that be an, an idea that goes with the direction that you are thinking or counting? There are several points that you talk about. First of all, I don't think that uh, the, the fact that uh, machines can uh, design tastes, that it has to do with the kind of sapiens that he's interested in. The kind of sapiens that he's interested in, the, the tasting and smelling is, is up to today, not something that robots can do. Um, but what they, and it's a kind of a, um, it's an interesting capitalist trick that is being done here, of course, that, of course, the, the one who are alienated are not linked to the land uh, in many ways. Uh, yet the one who can go to Noma and have a meal uh, can have a taste, at least, of it, can understand that, for instance, actually carrots that have been in the ground for two years can develop much more richer tastes and uh, which was in the ground already, but which we were uh, alienated from. Um, at the end of this chapter, actually, Sarah um, briefly uh, talks about the advantages of traveling, uh, saying that that does actually learn you. He connects it a lot with learning. Uh, as long as you taste and smell the earth, as long as you under, so he's not very fond about American wines, as we know, but there's, uh, and maybe not about America at all, actually, but, but the, the, so being brought up uh, at the riverbanks of the Garonne gave him uh, a kind of uh, a sense of that terroir, but the traveling that he'd done afterwards, and that I think he recommends all of us to do that, is also a way to expand one's wisdom in, in that sense, one's sapience, one's feeling of the earth. And again, that links very well to how Marx talks about the inorganic as not something which has to do with property, but more about how the earth becomes part of you in that sense. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I also have two questions that are related to um, what has already been said. So my first question would be, who this we actually is, and uh, he speaks of because that seems partly also sometimes just a bit problematic. Um, from who is we, sir? Uh, who is the we? Who is the us? In Sarah's text, in yeah. So in in the way um, that <clears throat> the we might might be, um, well, might be might emerge through like opening a bottle of wine together, and also probably. The Francocentric vibe all that has. 
us. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, whether from a like from a post-colonial perspective, um, I think you would be very confused by this like we and this understanding because obviously there's like this attempt to include humans and non-humans, but like from this perspective of like, yeah, who is this we here and who drinks the wine? Um, I'm I'm not so sure. Um, and I'd be interested in what you think about that. And then my second question is also, um, you touched upon that already with uh, Marx and um, with the Grundrisse, you, um, you're you interested in more in the kind of sensual uh, ecological Marx. However, um, there still seems to be this really important question of class and also with um, the research um, that is, um, that's been done in the last, I don't know, probably decade about um, what, which class has what understanding of nature and values like what things or what tastes um that seems to me also quite central here and whether this really is like a kind of whether whether there's like a class in the sign of this of this analysis so to speak uh thank you uh so two questions the first one uh who is the we uh it's an important one. And I think for that question, I would like to go back to Marx. When he talks about the commune, he makes a very interesting distinction saying that, that the commune is not about the verein, but about a vereinigung or a moment of coming together. That's what he finds so valuable in these German tribes. Uh, so it is not institutionalized uh, in the state form in that sense. But it is very much about a monthly or yearly meeting where people come together and uh, decide uh, on uh, what the community is all about. So I, I like that distinction between uh, being together and coming together, which is also how Serge starts, because he talks about old friends in this chapter of uh, uh, of the five senses. He talks about friends coming together at the table. Which is also, I mean, that, that's actually what the table is about. The table is empty most of the time, but you come together to share things. So I like that uh, that definition of we. Um, the question is probably still who who is invited to this table. Uh, yeah. And who is bringing the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you come to an, an, to the idea of class. I guess that's where you're aiming at. Uh, idea of class in Marx is, uh, of course, uh, hugely important. Uh, when he starts talking about labor and uh, how uh, capital uh, kind of take over. When he talks about German tribes, there's not so much discussion about class. Uh, at least not that well organized as in uh, the times that will follow. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned his name already. The, there's a Japanese Marxist who writes beautiful books, uh, world famous in Japan, and now only recently being translated into English language. My Japanese is also non-existent, so I, I have to learn it through that. Uh, Koji Koriani, mm -hmm. and he writes very much about uh, this other marks where uh, um, which is so much more about the becoming and about a, a, a turning into a community than uh, um, starting from the idea of the state uh, mm -hmm. so and and that also allows us to see how there is no such thing as class but the class thing becomes important when he would say when foreign powers take over, because in Marx it's also the case that the state apparatus always comes from the outside and dominates a community. And that is why the word democracy is of importance, because democracy means that the power goes back to those who inhabit the land and not so much to those who own things or those who have property. Uh, so I think the emphasis on the processes of becoming learn that has a lot to teaches us a lot about how uh, class differences operate uh, as a political tool uh, and uh, but it's always and and about uh, and kind of process a kind of alienation alienation is one of those 
ways in which this this class differences when we see class differences crystal out so uh, <clears throat> i think uh, yeah in that sense it's always the second step to take